everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have you here. Um, I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cask, whose mission is all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers, like some of you who are joining us today. Um, and so we have been doing these virtual tastings for, gosh, since March, which seems crazy. Yeah. When we first started doing them, we thought we'd be doing them for, you know, a month, maybe two. <laughs> Um, and now it's become a, a full-time part of our job. State of the world, yeah. Yeah, and this is Evan, my co-host and partner. Hi there, uh, I'm Evan. I'm a certified sommelier, um, advanced W set holder, and uh, <laughs> certified cider professional. And my last 10 years have been spent doing bespoke wine tours up in Napa and Sonoma. Um, so the opportunity to continue to, uh, you know, um, share my passion and interest in uh, all things craft alcohol. Uh, obviously, wine is kind of my first love. Um, but uh, equal opportunity, scotch drinker, beer drinker, <laughs> whatever. Um, we you have know. no favorite children. Exactly. Um, whatever it might be was a, a really fun opportunity with Suzanne and the Crafty Cask, um, hosting virtual tastings uh, on a weekly forum, um, as well as for private clients and um, corporate events and things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, for sure. We've been doing a lot of corporate events lately. Yeah, it's been crazy. Um, wow. So while we wait for people to get settled in, I know we have a few people here. Hello, Cindy, Greg, Jim, Rachel, all of you. Nice to see you here. Um, while we give people a couple more minutes to settle in, we um, let's tell you a little bit about kind of our virtual tasting experiences. Yeah. Because, you know, we're going to spend most of our time together today teaching you how to create engaging virtual tasting experiences yourself. And that is highly valuable. Um, and there's just a lot of tips and tricks of the trade that we've learned after doing these for six or so months that we want to share with you um, to help you, you know, improve maybe some of the virtual events you're already doing. Or, or inspire yourself to get yeah. started and maybe if do you haven't things. Done one yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we also, you know, we host virtual events here at the Crafty Cask and ours are a little bit different than if you were to host them yourself. So if you host them yourself, you know, primarily you're reaching your existing audience. You're promoting it on social media, to your newsletter, things of that nature. And it's great. It's really important to keep your existing audience engaged. But as we all know, your existing audience can only buy so much wine during right. this crazy time, right? Like you can only tap into them so many times to say, support us, buy more wine. We need your support. We need your help. So growing your audience during this time is really important too. And so our um, events that we do at the Crafty Cask are designed to kind of do that. So we always feature at least two craft makers and we theme them around an event. We've done, let's see, Pinot Party. Pinot Party, um, um, had a Rosé event. California Cabernets, mm -hmm. we did a Chardonnay and Popcorn event. Um, and so those are kind of our wine the events. The Rhone Rangers. Oh yeah, the Rhone, the Rhone varietals. It's okay to drink a Rhone. Yes, that was a fun <laughs> one. Um, and so those are designed to be category level so that we can bring multiple makers in who make those styles of wine and introduce them to each other's audiences and introduce them to our audience as well. So that way you're not just speaking to your own audience, but you have three different brands promoting on your behalf. We're all kind of chipping in. And then we're all, we also always make sure to promote at least two weeks in advance so that we can drive people to your website to purchase your wine and kind of be sipping along with us as well. Or during the event, we try to make them as jealous as humanly possible that they're not sipping on your delicious wine with us so that they want to order some afterwards. Yeah, well, not vital to have the, you know, the attendees consuming the product that is being discussed, it really does make for a more immersive experience. For sure. Um, when you can speak to, you know, the elements that you're picking up in the bouquet and the aromas, um, and they can be like, oh yeah, I do get banana peel or whatever it might happen to be, um, really makes them feel like they're connected. And that's all that this is all about, you know, figuring out how in this current world, people can still feel a sense of connection. Um, and so while we're kind of talking to you and uh, you can't see each other just simply because of the format of, of, of this event. Right. Um, we always host ours in web, or I'm sorry, in meeting, meeting format, format as opposed right. to webinar, um, which allows the audience to see the rest of the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, looking at people's faces and watching their faces as they reveal, like, as they realize something, as something is revealed and like getting to kind of see the whole crowd um, we definitely recommend. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and we'll, we'll get, get into, into that a yeah. little bit more uh, yeah. as we dive in here. <laughs> um, and then the other thing we've been doing a lot lately, which are highly um, valuable for you guys just to know about our corporate events. 
Um, so we started doing these public weekly tastings that we do every Thursday night that are free for consumers to attend and are what we just kind of explained. So those were kind of the fun every Thursday night events. And we'll throw a um, link in there. So if you're interested in joining us on one of those, you can. Um, but we've also kind of fallen into doing tons of corporate events. And I'll tell you guys, like people are willing to throw down a lot of money to buy a lot of wine for their guests to have a great experience. Yeah. So um, if you you're for lead generation, you see it for, you know, team building uh, for uh, sales reps are yeah. doing it for their kind of accounts, things of that nature. So it's a great um, market to kind of get into as well. So if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to us. We're both just at the craftycast.com. So Suzanne and Evan. Um, for email and we'd be happy to kind of work you into whenever we have wine event requests, you know, know that we have some more partners who are interested in doing that and can ship to different states because like I said, that's, that's a pretty fun, easy way and you guys don't even have to join us for that. Sometimes they do want the makers to join us, but a lot of times we can just be your brand reps and kind of help get the name, your word out there and the name out. Yeah. All right. I think we've given people enough time to join here. Um, I'm just throwing that link in the chat now for all of you, but let's get started with hosting your own virtual tasting experiences. Jennifer, did you have anything you wanted to chime in with before we kind of keep rolling on here? No, I think that's great. And I love the idea of the corporate tastings. And we are kind of uniquely set up through our relationship with Vino Shipper to be able to have our members ship wherever they need to, to ship in order to, to facilitate that. That's right. Yeah. So we should definitely talk about that because it is a great way to get some money into pockets right now when it's so hard. I really need it, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's jump in. Um, we'll give you a little bit of, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through a few different areas today. We're gonna walk through technology when it comes to hosting your virtual tasting events, kind of logistics and things to think about um, and like what our setup is. And Evan's gonna actually take our, our camera and kind of show you around our setup so you can see the lighting we use and all different stuff like that. Then we'll talk a little bit about pre-event prep and then during the event itself. Um, and of course, if you have questions or anything, feel free to throw them into the chat. We love to hear from you. We want to make sure that you get what you want out of this. So while we have, you know, our whole spiel and what we're interested in talking about, we want to make sure you get your questions answered. So feel free to be chatty with us. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, and as we're talking, just so you know, especially when we go through that logistics and setup phase, I think Evan's going to throw a link in the chat right now. We will be showing you some items that are a little bit of an investment if you want to go there. So lighting, webcams, things of that nature. So we put a link in there that actually has all the things that we'll be showing you. So you can go and check them out on Amazon and, and see them yourself. Uh, I did throw that in there. And I also uh, just uh, put a, a link to some tutorial docs for that we'll be talking about great virtual hosting event tips and tricks. Yeah, for sure. And so those docs you can download and you can grab and all that good stuff. That's awesome. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video just because I don't really need to be. Sure, um, feel free. To <laughs> it's, it's distracting. No problem. Um, all right. And we would love it um, if any of you who are joining would love to throw in the chat where you're joining from and what your winery is just so we kind of know who we're talking to. And, you know, if any of you are, gosh, feels like anywhere that wine's being grown right now in Northern California and Washington and Oregon and dealing with these fires. I hope you're safe. I hope your yeah, wineries are safe. You. Your families are safe. Um, I hope your grapes are safe. Yeah, we're we're in San Francisco, so we're close to the craziness, but safe from it. Um, but our, our hearts go out to all of you, and hopefully this helps us start this time. Um, all right. So now let's. There we go. There we go. Now we're good. Okay, so let's jump in and talk all about technology. And Ev, Ev I always tease Evan that he's mm -hmm. kind of my CTO as well as my, my host. So I'm going to let you um, kind of do the rundown. Do the rundown here. Certainly. So um, we're on Zoom right now. That is our preferred, uh, you know, video software choice. Um, and while the uh, the free option is certainly a, a you know a plausible way to go those are capped at 40 minutes um and so at that point if you hit the 40 minute mark the meeting just ends and that's you know a, not an ideal situation for you to be in um especially if you weren't paying attention and you get to that 40 minute mark mid-sentence um so uh we would probably advise investing in the next tier up which i think is 15 dollars, and that gives you a whole bunch of bells and whistles um and uh, you know features that we really feel are useful, like recording, polling, uh, other you know user management features. 
but totally workable to get started if you're not ready to invest in something that you're not sure if you feel comfortable doing. But hopefully by the end of this, you will feel comfortable because um, it is, you know, it's really valuable and it's straightforward enough that if you feel comfortable enough talking to someone in person, uh, that with a little practice using Zoom, uh, you're going to be able to feel comfortable talking to them virtually. For sure. Um, yeah. But uh, whatever tools you decide to use, we really advise going through all of the different settings that are there and making sure that you understand what they mean, what they're what they are adjusting, and what they toggle on or off, or you know, scalable. Simply because if you aren't aware of them, then they can come out and bite you. Um, and particularly as it pertains to things like screen sharing, um, there's been some terrible stories that I imagine you might have heard of people kind of Zoom bombing where they join a meeting uh, unannounced, uninvited, and start putting you know inappropriate images up on the screen or promoting um, a competing brand yeah right that's not cool um <clears throat> and and with the settings too i know when we first started doing these you know it just i mean if you go to the zoom settings it is a long pages list and like it's a long list and so it does behoove you because one of the very first events we did we were so bummed afterwards that when we went back and looked at the recording we only had it toggled on to record the speaker view so basically you only got what you're seeing right now right. of us. But as we said earlier, we really like to do the meeting view so you can see the whole gallery of everyone smiling and cheersing and like laughing. And, and we didn't have any of that recording because we didn't go through our settings carefully enough. So it's just those little things to make sure. Um, and if you want people to registration to be required, passwords, you know, all yeah, that kind of stuff. Learn through our uh, experience yeah. instead of your own important. experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. On that note, we definitely recommend recording both views. Um, the gallery view can provide some really fun marketing uh, materials you know, yeah. for later. Yeah, some, and to promote future events. Yeah, um, definitely. So think, don't think of these as like a one-time hit. Like, okay, we're going to go on video and do a thing, and then that's the end of it. Like, there's a lot of content that can come out of these that you can use for lots of different ways, and to promote future virtual events too. Yeah, look for uh, you know fun outtakes that you can make short, you know, thirty-second uh, YouTube uh, or maybe not YouTube, but like. Facebook ads or just fun kind of engagement uh, material for Facebook and, and Instagram. We have a 30 um, second one on our YouTube channel. If you want to go check it out where I'm teasing Evan because someone gave me like, Ooh, good notes on the nose. She got and, I, kudos. and I'm like, you're the psalm. I'm the <laughs> one getting that. So we have some fun outtakes too. Um, we also generally recommend uh, joining these from two devices. As you can see, we're actually joined from three devices today and we'll show you why in a little bit. Um, but that's really helpful. Uh, to have a co-host and to have you both join. That way you can kind of share the duties of responding and paying attention to people in the chat. And um, even if you can't have a co-host next to you like we do, um, even if you have another person from your winery on their computer at home co-hosting with you, it's really helpful to have two people keeping an eye on the chat, engaging while the other one's talking, reminding each other of like things they forgot to say, sure. because you can privately chat each other too. So it is really helpful to just have a little backup. Um, and, uh, when you do that, if, if you do join with two devices in the same location as we are right now, uh, it is vital. And always remember to disconnect the audio for one of them. Um, you'll figure out right away if, uh, if you didn't do that, uh, generates feedback that is just, I mean, everybody can hear it and it's awful. And um, muting isn't enough. You really want to disconnect point. your audio yeah. from the secondary computers if you're in the same room. Um, let's see. Other technology points there, you know, the, the documents that we sent um, in the chat box, there's a little collection of kind of Zoom overlays that goes through. Real quick? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Let's show them real quick, just in case you're a little less familiar with Zoom, although I feel like by now we are all <laughs> becoming Zoom pros. Um, there we go. So yeah, we generally walk people through these. And as Suzanne was saying, we don't really need to do it as much these days, but initially it was really helpful to kind of point out, oh, there's the gallery view. And it was really fun to see, you know, as soon as they click the gallery view and they'd see all their friends and everybody else that was there, uh, their faces kind of light up and you're like, oh, Because that's cool. the thing, if you don't tell people this, a lot of them are watching it just in speaker view. That's and default. and yeah. it does feel a lot more like a party when you get to see everyone, yeah. you know, like it just feels more engaging and interactive than when you're just like, when it's just the two of us, it feels a little bit more of like a lecture. Yeah. yeah. Um, on that note, when you're in gallery view, when it's, uh, you know, it's time for in our personal, you know, public tasting events um, to speak with one of the makers, we do use the spotlight feature, which is a really 
cool feature that allows you to kind of force everybody into speaker mode when you know the presenter from a, a brand is going to be speaking about their product and about their story so that well one everybody watching knows who it is you know it's it's very clear that this is the person that's speaking uh you know you might know that there's a little yellow box around the uh speaker when you're in gallery view but not everybody knows that so again helpful to kind of direct their attention and they can always switch it back to gallery view uh, once you've spotlighted them but it does um, give them the opportunity to understand and recognize who's being um, who's being called on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then here, this you know, kind of runs through uh, some other helpful things. The raise hand feature is one that we really like a lot, uh, and directing people to engage that way um, because you know you see that their hand, their virtual hand, is raised, and then you can actually call on them and have them you know turn their mic on to turn their camera on and ask their question or make their comment. Because um, we do always prefer, and we tell people this in the beginning, we would rather you unmute yourself and talk to us and talk to the maker than just put your question in the chat. So a lot of times, even if they put their question in the chat, we'll still say, hey, Jim, I saw you had a question there. You wanna unmute yourself and, and ask it? You know, And it just, it creates that connection and it gets people out of the like passive scrolling on my phone, kind of half listening, kind of like, because it makes them realize like, oh, I could actually, engage right. and be part of this. Um, and we always remind them like, how often do you get to hang out with a winemaker or a mead maker or anything else like this? Like take advantage of that and talk to them. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and yeah. then, Can you know, if you wanted to chat with someone privately, you know, the option to do that, of course, is there in the chat uh, and letting people know that in, I guess it can encourage them to message you privately if they have something that they yeah. I'm nervous about saying in front of the, you know, in the chat for the entire, for the entire group. Um, and then this is also helpful how to know how to kick somebody out and also make sure that they can't rejoin. Because yeah. if you do have someone that needs to be removed, uh, if you don't have the settings, again, check that the is. settings. Uh, if you don't have the settings uh, properly adjusted, they'll be able to rejoin. Um, and the enabling the waiting room is really nice, especially if you have multiple people joining who are going to be presenting with you, because that way you can let all of them in early and you guys can join 15 minutes ahead of time. And then you can just leave everyone else in the waiting room until you're ready to start. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, that's a nice feature as well. Uh, helpful to remember to turn the waiting room off once you have admitted everyone from the waiting room. Simply yeah, so because... you don't have to keep admitting everyone one by one while yeah. you're trying to talk. Um, yeah, and then we have a few more overlays kind of in here, but we shared the link. And so you can actually download this whole, this whole document and it goes through kind of some more of our tips and tricks. Yeah. Um, that kind of started bleeding over a little bit into logistics. Uh, a little bit, but not too much. <clears throat> um, so we're going to show you around our setup a little bit and talk through some of the specific components kind of as we go. Um, and so, yeah, do you want to kind of yeah, walk sure. them around and I'll, I'll, be the guide here. Um, and so, like I said, some of the things we're going to show you are a little bit of an additional investment. I know money's tight right now. You don't actually need to use any of these things, but you can. Um, and they do help make things a little more professional, a little easier on you, um, and a little more consistent as well. Um, so, like we said before, if possible, have two co-hosts, even in different locations. Um, divide and conquer. So while one is actively talking and engaged, you know, the, the other one can be kind of doing things. And so you can see right here, if you want to show them back, we have two. Do you want to spotlight me perhaps? Oh yeah, let me spotlight you so I don't keep stealing the. Um, so you can see right here that we have two different setups. And the reason we did, and then you can see behind, we have a big kind of screen. And so the nice thing about having a big screen is two things. One, you can have a cheat sheet up on your big screen because it's right next to your, so you can see I have my notes of the things I don't want to miss out on telling you about <laughs> because there's a lot to remember. And so I have my nice little cheat sheet there, but it's right on my big screen and it's right beneath my webcam, which is right up on top of here. And so we are using a webcam and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is so that we can have our camera further away from us. Now we have had a lot of experience watching other people's tastings and it's really I know it's really tempting to have your camera like right up like this and have your face in it. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's not engaging. All right. Like it's not like give yourself a little space. And the other thing is you want to be able to actually have your wine glass in front of you and do your tasting and have the camera be able to catch this 
as well as you and as well as whatever your beautiful background is that you want it to be. Now, the other reason to move your webcam further back from you is that so when you are typing in, so a couple things. Because our webcam is up on a bigger screen that our laptops are connected to, I'm always like, it looks like I'm looking at you, right? It looks like, because that's where all of your beautiful faces are when we're hosting, they're all up on this big screen. And so it reminds me, that's where the people are. That's where the camera is, eyes up. If you're using your webcam on your computer, what's happening is you're doing a lot of this and this and this. And it's just not engaging, right? Like it's just not super fun to see the top of someone's head while they're kind of <laughs> looking down. Cause, and it's just because the camera is too low. It's too low, it's too close. So we really suggest having two camera, two computers set up if you have two, if you have a co-host, having one of them ported into a bigger screen. Honestly, sometimes we use our TV in our living room where we port it right into our TV. And then we have a really big screen with everyone's faces on it. Um, and then have that webcam on the monitor kind of pushed back from you. Uh, additionally here, you can see our lighting. So this lighting is a is big ring light. Um, yeah, lighting is very important. You want to look bright and energetic and fresh and clean and crisp. You don't want to have weird sunlight coming in. So you see like we have a window here, but we have it closed because it just, it, it brings in weird lighting. We can't control it. It might get sunny while we're in the middle of something. It might get dark while we're in the middle of something. Um, and then in our apartment, we don't have great lighting. So this light, do you want to play with it a little bit yeah, and show? So this light is really nice because it lights up a big space and it also has um, a dimmer so it can go brighter and so it can go super bright and it can also go cooler and warmer. And so you can just kind of play with it based on the setting that you're in. Um, and so we highly recommend getting some lighting and it's a, it's a little bit of an investment. It's not crazy, crazy expensive, but it is something that is helpful. Now, if you don't want to go that big, we have this smaller ring light over here. Um, and this works just fine, especially if you're going to be using the camera on your phone. And so this is nice because you actually put the camera lens right through the little ring. And it kind of, the, the reason why people use ring lights instead of big lights is because it kind of gives a nice glow around you instead of being a spotlight on you. And so that's why ring lights have become more popular than kind of huge lighting kind of structures. Um, this one yeah. also has a little bit of temperature adjustment options. Um, yeah. As dimmer. well as, yeah, the dimmer. Yeah. And so that one is a much more affordable investment and great for on the go too, because it clips to any surface kind of, and you can kind of use it on the go. Um, let's see what else are that. Oh, our tables. Let's show that our, like we talked before. So we have a table on top of a table. So can you show this table here? Oh, and yeah. There's two reasons for that. So we have a table on top of a table because A, we wanted to have a nice wood surface. We didn't want like our crappy party pop-up table to be our surface. And also for like we were saying before, to get this monitor further away back, close, Sorry. <laughs> further away back from our computers. Um, and so you just have to get creative a little bit because we're all at home or we're in our like winery or distillery and it's a little weird. Um, so that's kind of the big pieces of our setups with, um, Camera angles, also, I mentioned you don't want to be too close. I do also want to mention you don't want to be super far away. So we've also seen a lot of um, winery virtual tastings where, you know, you have this beautiful tasting room and you want it all to be shown. And so you put, uh oh, you're still spotlight. Hold on. <laughs> Spotlight you. Um, and so you want to, you know, really showcase your beautiful tasting room. And so you put the camera really far back and then you're standing behind the tasting bar and you're like this big and it just doesn't work guys. I'm sorry. So find a corner in your tasting room or find a corner in your vineyard or in your production facility that is kind of cool or cozy or funky or whatever. And like make that the central focus. Um, people want to see you. They want to feel like you're the right size that you're supposed to be. They want to, you know, it makes it more, more real, honestly. Um, what else? What else? Anything else that I missed? I think that covers most yeah, everything. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Let's see. Any questions, anyone? Let us know. And if you're getting any Q&A in there, Jennifer, feel free to shoot them over our way too. Um, all right, let's talk about pre-event prep. Um, I'll talk about pre-event prep and then you can do during the event. Does that sound good? good? Yeah. <clears throat> so pre-event, promote, promote, promote. Remember, this is marketing, okay? Like, yes, I know sometimes we're putting these events on because we just want to engage with our client base and we want to like kind of have fun with them. But 
marketing. Like this is, these are tough times. And so you want to get the most out of everything you do. We're all busy. We don't have a lot of free time and resources. Um, and so promote to your newsletter, to your social media, your personal social media, this can be, you know, and this is also one of the benefits, like we said, of joining our virtual tasting events is that we're promoting for you. The other winery or meadery is promoting for you as well. Um, and so think about those partnerships you can create. So it's not reliant just on you and your promotions, but you can get some other people promoting with you for you as well. Um, now the next thing is we do, um, suggest registration for events. So one of the reasons we suggest that you have people register for your events is one of the reasons that Evan already mentioned to kind of cut down on the trolls and people who are going to kind of sneak in if you were just to publicly put a zoom link out there on social media. It's not the best idea. You get a lot of spammy kind of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, but the other reason I really, the other two reasons are you'll know the attendee count in advance, right? And so we're all busy. We all have a lot to do. If you only have one or two people signed up four days before, you have a decision to make. You either are going to reschedule probably, or you need to like turn on that marketing engine real fast and try to get those numbers up. But without registration, you have no idea who's showing up. You're just like showing up to a webcam and like hoping that someone else is there. So it's important to, to get that count in advance. Now, the other reason to have people register is because you get the emails of anyone who registers when you do that. And I don't know about you, but I am always trying to grow my email list and get more people in touch and in contact with my brand. And so when they register, you get their email address. And all you have to do is just on the registration confirmation email that they'll get automatically from Zoom, just edit it and put a little note at the bottom that says, by registering for this event, you are also opting into the newsletter. And we're going to keep you up to date on the event and on future events. And you can unsubscribe at any time. Um, and then you get to grow your newsletter with people who are interested in your brand as well. <clears throat> um, just real briefly, there's a question here from Greg about sound. And uh, mm -hmm. other than you know making sure that a, a second device is disconnected from audio, we haven't found too much uh, trouble with people hearing us properly using the microphone that is embedded with the webcam. Um, it is a omnidirectional yeah. microphone that's on either side of the webcam and that is pretty good at picking up the sound with clarity and fidelity. Um, the, Do you want to grab the mics we have in that bottom drawer there sure. too though? We, we don't use them as, as often but yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah I think if you're if you're using your phone or your laptop sound could be a little bit more iffy, but honestly, a lot of times nowadays, the, the mics are pretty good. Um, but if you do have that far away from you, then you wanna be thinking about that. So the webcam mics that are omnidirectional, they tend to have very good sound um, quality. Then there's also mics like this that you can get um, that kind of plug in as well. And these definitely capture very nicely. Um, now they also capture background noise a little bit more because sure. they are good microphones, right? So you have to just be cognizant of that. And so if production is going on one room over and you're doing a virtual tape, it's probably going to pick some of that up. And so you want to be careful about that. Now you can also kind of look for something, uh, what's known as a directional mic as opposed to omnidirectional. And that sure. way, if you do have background noise that you can't really get away from, um, focusing the directional mic specifically on yourself uh, is a good way to kind of ameliorate that so that you don't have all sorts of other sounds going on in the background. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, next for prep before the event. So preparation is key. Don't just show up without a plan and expect it to go well. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like crucial, less crucial if you're just doing a happy hour and you're telling everyone to just show up with their favorite bottle of your wine and like do a cheers. But even if you're doing that, I would still suggest preparing with some fun icebreakers, thought starter questions, things to get people talking and engaging with you. Um, but you do really want to be thinking about preparation and what you can be doing to get the most value for your brand during this. So things like, you know, what the structure is um, and really thinking through how much time are you going to spend on each thing? Because let me tell you, you think that like, oh my gosh, an hour is a long time to fill. <laughs> when you start talking about something you're passionate about, like your wine or your mead, all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, it's 45 minutes in and we haven't even started tasting, you know, like it gets a little crazy and the time moves quickly. Um, so related to that, I don't think we mentioned before, have a clock somewhere nearby in front of you that's like digital and visible to keep you on track a little bit and remind you of what, what time it is. Um, but, you know, have a rough outline for the event. 
have some visuals to share to bring to life in a more holistic way and help guests feel like they're visiting or learning. A lot of people overlook this, and we honestly feel like this is one of the reasons our events are so popular, because every maker we feature, we have them send us videos and images of the production, of their team, of their winery dog, of all that stuff. <laughs> That's always a hit. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and as we're talking, and, and we don't use them as a presentation. We don't use them like they're a PowerPoint because that gets boring. We all know that. But like as the winemaker is talking, we'll just cycle through them. And occasionally maybe he'll see something on screen and be like, oh, I want to talk about that for a second. But usually it's just Kind of background visuals because after a while it gets a little boring looking at just the same people's faces the whole time. Yeah. So think about visuals and how you can really make it immersive and bring it to life. Um, also keep a document with all the links or other information you'll want to share so you can chat and copy and paste them quickly on the fly. Um, so you saw that we threw some links in the chat earlier. We have a, do a Google Doc that we just keep that's called links <laughs> and it's just for our virtual tastings. And so we have all of our like our five common links that we kind of want to share with everyone all the time. And then we'll put the specific maker links in for specific ones. Their social handles, There's, you know, the right. stores where their products can be purchased, uh, things of that nature. And that way you're just toggling between to grab it, copy, grab it, paste, grab it, copy, grab it, paste. It makes your life a lot just easier. Just another cheat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then if you have a paid account on Zoom, like we mentioned, it's, it's recommended. Um, Think about using the added features like polling your audience. That's really valuable. Um, so whenever we do a virtual event, we ask people what their current thought is about that specific style of wine we're talking about, if they've ever had wines from this maker before. And it gives us data, right? It helps us understand how many new audience members were just introduced to this winemaker versus how many people already knew about them. And how many people at the beginning of this said they weren't really sure about Pinot. And by the end, they said they were definitely going to buy something from these makers. Those are re that's really cool data to have because it helps you feel like there's tangible, real value there. And there is tangible, real value in these when you do them right. Um, lastly, on prep, I would say um, two things. So do a trial run, especially if it's your first time ever doing one of these. It doesn't have to be the full event, but this is also where having two computers or two devices can be helpful because you want to log in on one as the host and log in on one as a participant. And the reason for that is so that you can see what your participants are experiencing as you're doing things, as you're sharing the screen. And sharing the screen, always practice that before you go live. Because depending on the format of the document. Yeah. Um, Whether it's a PDF or an image file or a video. Or a Google Doc or a website yeah. or whatever. Like it just, things share differently. And depending on the device you're on, there's some little weird tips and tricks of like, how come that's not sharing? Oh, I have to go touch that application again to get it to share. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, I always just practice sharing. I practice sharing every single time, even though I do these five times a week now. Um, and then before starting, restart your computer. Oh, yeah. This is like our number one tip, especially if you're like me who has four Google windows and 18 tabs on each Google window open at all times. Um, restart it. Like, don't just shut everything down, like reboot it, let it like clean itself out a little bit, let it get its memory up and running again, and then only open the things that you actually need for that virtual tasting experience. Um, that really is important to kind of make sure there's no technical yeah. snafus. Yeah, unless you've got a high powered computer, um, even something like screen sharing while also streaming your own video can be taxing on computers if they haven't yeah you know, had their memory kind of cleared out recently by a, a nice hard restart. And if you're worried about your Wi-Fi at all, um, if ever, if it's ever possible, hardline in. That is like your best bet is to yeah. hardline into your internet. If not, try to get your, is it the router or modem? I always confuse them. The router. The router. Try to get the router to be like in eye line sight of your computer. It's like not hidden under a desk or anything. Like just having that straight line of sight between the two does help with your Wi-Fi as well, yeah. um, because that that is important, and we've definitely had situations where our Wi-Fi has gone a little wonker, wonky yeah, on us. That's uncomfortable when when something is completely out of your control and yeah. people are there waiting on bated breath to hear your next word, and it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and with that, I just thought of something else. Sorry. Um, Virtual backgrounds are really fun. I strongly suggest you turn on the option for your guests to use virtual backgrounds. I do not suggest you use a virtual background as the host. Um, it just gets like when you move, like your hands disappear and stuff. And if you're Italian like me, you're moving a lot. <laughs> and the hands um, are moving a lot. <laughs> um, but so it just, it, it looks weird as the host, I would say. Yeah. So just find a clear background. We usually clear our bar off here and just have the featured products that we have up behind us. We also sometimes actually put up 
um, like a drop cloth that is made for this. That's kind of like a green screen. And so if you want to do that, you can do that. We have our favorite um, brand of kind of green screens that are patterned and beautiful and wood and things of that nature that don't wrinkle um, up on that list. The as well. lack of wrinkling is really important. Really yes. important. She'll be ironing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's move into during the event. Tips during the event. Um, as we did today, it's always nice to give people a little time to join. Mm -hmm. um, we suggest, you know, five minutes or so. And while you're waiting for people to join, that's a great time to uh, let people know about the poll that you've put up and ask them if they would be so kind as to uh, answer the questions and also chime in in the chat and let people know where they're joining uh, from and, and you know what brands they represent or what they're what they're sipping on uh, things of that nature so that they start to become you know engaged and feel comfortable reaching out and, and uh, saying things I guess <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> at the same time you don't want to wait too long because you want to reward the people that are nice. on time <laughs> um, so I think five minutes we've found to be generally a pretty good uh, starting point. Um, or, you know, if you, if you log in and, and uh, let people in from the waiting room and you've already got 20 people that are ready to go, don't, don't keep them waiting more than feels comfortable. Yeah, you know, if people sure. are chatty and uh, you feel like it's okay to wait for five minutes, that's fine. But if they're sitting there waiting, you might as well get started. 20 people is enough, you know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> we generally recommend keeping people on mute during the course of the event. Um, this is primarily to eliminate background noise. Someone's cooking dinner, uh, you know, off the screen or the dog is running around barking or kids or any number of things like that can, uh, you know, harm the audio quality for everybody else that's attending. And so keeping everybody on mute just by the standard uh, is what we would recommend. At the same time, when we do that, we recommend and let people know that yeah. it's not because we don't want to hear from them. <laughs> It's really just for background noise yeah. and encourage them to please, please feel free at any time to unmute themselves mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, make a comment, ask a question, um, right. so that they're engaged. So Suzanne mentioned earlier, you know, getting an outline and an idea of what you're going to talk about uh, and having that, you know, roughly timed out, let people know, tell them, hey, we're going to spend about 10 minutes doing this and then we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to go into pre-event prep and then we're going to go into during the events and tell people what you're going to be talking about so that they know that, oh, well, when they're done with this section, then we get to the wine that I'm really interested yeah, in. And then right. I got to go cook dinner, but at least I can wait around until that, that they get to that wine. And it's important to, we find with our um, tasting experiences in particular, it takes us a little longer to get to the actual tasting than maybe people think is going to, you know, because some people, some tastings that happen you show up and they're immediately like, okay, pour this gla glass and let's start drinking, you know? And we like to give some, like we're storytellers. And so we like to give some context and some history and do some myth busting and like get people ready for, you know, show some pictures and then kind of really dive into the tasting. And so setting that expectation for people not only lets them know like what to expect, but we also give them permission to start drinking before that. And that's important in this industry, <laughs> right? People join because they want to drink and they want to hang out with other people who want to drink what they're drinking. And so giving them that lay of the land and saying, we're going to start with this wine, but we're probably not going to dive into the formal tasting for another 15 minutes. But if you want to crack it open and start sipping on it now, feel free. Don't let us stand between you and the drinks. Yeah. You know? And the sooner, the sooner you start lubricating those wheels, the more likely people yes. are to start engaging and talking. Get and, more casual, and relaxed. Yeah, exactly. Um, after, you know, kind of giving a high level review, actually before, probably one of the first things, don't forget to introduce yourself. <laughs> We've done this. We have done this. Um, even if you're the winemaker uh, or, or, you know, the, even if you're the owner uh, or both, people might not know who you are. Now, granted, somebody probably does, but what if they've got a friend there with them or their spouse and they don't? Let them know so that everybody's on the same page and nobody feels like they're left out. They're left out. Exactly. Yeah. Or they're not part of the community or the group. And trust me, it does get a little like, you know, we do these every single Thursday night and then we do our corporate events all the time. But the Thursday night ones, we have a lot of regulars. We have a lot of people who show up week in and week out. And it does like we, we start to shortchange it a little bit because we feel bad because we're like, oh, they have to sit through our same spiel every Thursday night for five minutes. But 
it's disrespectful to the new people who are joining and you want like them, you know, you, they're already regulars. They already love us. They're going to keep coming back. <laughs> they, they can join five minutes late if they want to. Right. Um, so it's important to, to really spend the time to help people get to know you and your brand every single time you do one of these. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also recommend kind of going over, uh, house rules. Um, in this folder that I just, the Google folder, I just put in the chat again, this has our cheat sheet with our house rules in it and our helpful tech tips and tricks yeah. that you can grab. Again, this is to make people feel comfortable. People that haven't joined one of your events before, um, gives them a, a little bit more of a lay of the land, um, and helps them understand that, you know, they're very much encouraged to participate. And, you know, while participation is encouraged, you know, uh, offensive uh, replies and things of that nature maybe will not be tolerated. Not be tolerated. Yeah. Um, so, you know, where the spectrum lies for it, the level of engagement that you're looking for um, is something that we recommend covering in those house rules. Um, and then once you get into the main content, you know, just relax and have fun and let your exuberance and your passion for, you know, the products that you're sharing shine through because uh, that will also help to entice and encourage people to engage and participate and ask questions and comments and share their own feelings and their own passion about your product, which is fun for you to hear too. Yeah. You know, you, I'm sure having people uh, go on little diatribes about how much your, uh, you know, Riesling changed their life is, is re as rewarding for you as hearing uh, from you is for them. So uh, let that shine through. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the reasons we enjoy doing this and we've done this for, you know, a cider organization and a distilling organization mm -hmm. is because the more you get all this other crap kind of that we've just spent 40 minutes talking about down, the more you can be present and engage and relax and just be yourself. And the more you can infuse your personality into things, and that's where my Italian nature is kind of helpful because I think, you know, seeing movement and seeing the exuberance and passion is like, it gets people upright and paying attention a little bit and reminding them that like, oh, we're not just like bored, like watching a show, you know? <laughs> um, and so the more you can do that and get yourself comfortable, the more engaged your audience is going to be. And that's also why it is really helpful to have a co-host. And honestly, even if it's your wife or your husband and they're not even working on the business, like it's okay. Like this is casual. This is, and like, that's one of the best things about this kind of crazy world we're living through is like we're all getting glimpses into each other's personal lives and we're all breaking down those walls a little bit more and so like it's nice to have someone to riff off of it's nice to have someone laugh at your jokes it's nice to have someone like elbow you and like make fun of you a little bit because that just like it makes it more real and it makes them feel more real and then maybe they're willing to say hey honey why don't you come join me for this this is kind of fun yeah right like instead of it being like i'm really into wine she's not we're just like talking wine it also helps them feel comfortable turning their camera on you know people that are yeah. sitting there in their sweatpants they're like oh i don't uh i don't look put together enough to be on camera but if you're there and you know your your dog is running around or your kid comes and hops up in your lap or yeah Sure. You know, your your husband or wife swings by and gives you a little kiss on the cheek while you're, you know, talking about the the, the wines or the meads. Um, then they're like, oh yeah, I can be on camera. You know, we're just hanging out. It's not, you know, a, a lecture. It's not a. Yeah. Uh, academic, you know, dissertation. You know. And on the <laughs> camera off thing, in the beginning encourage people to turn their cameras on. Yeah, just, get, get, just we, we just like kind of give them a little shit. We're just a little bit like, listen, we know it might be a no shower day. It Nobody might be cares. a day that like you didn't do your hair and makeup. Like we're all friends here. We'd love to see your faces and see the wine you're drinking and swirl the glass together. And cause that kind of stuff too, getting people active and engaged. So asking people to all toast up to the camera or swirl their glass together and look at it um, is really, I wish there was wine in this. It's like 10 in the morning, but I wish there was. <laughs> I'm like, this is really odd doing this with nothing in it. Um, but that gets people again, engaged. The more you can get them physically engaged with you, the better. Yeah. Um, and having their camera on helps that. And so just encouraging them in the beginning and saying, we'd love to see your faces. If you have your camera off, we'd love it. If you'd, you know, join us, um, does get at least a few people usually to turn their cameras on. Yeah. 
All right. I think with that, those are kind of all of our tips and tricks. Points, yeah. I'm going to throw into the chat here as well. If you want to um, take a look at any of our replays from our virtual tastings that we've done with other makers, just to get a sense and a feel for how ours kind of flow and work, um, feel free to check those out. And then, you know, we also told you how to get in touch with us. If you're interested in joining one of those, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's our, our tips and tricks. If you have any questions or yeah, anything. Say, if anybody has any further questions. Uh, otherwise, Jennifer, did you have a, a few words to say or any questions yourself? Anybody has some questions? Uh oh, your mic is a little funny. Hold on. Um, can you hear me now? That sounds, that sounds better, better yeah. Um, yeah, just if anybody has a question, we'll give it a minute just to let somebody drop it in the chat box. Um, of course. Great presentation. Thank you for being so thorough and explaining everything and um, from the marketing and from the technical aspect and just, you know, giving people instructions on how to do this. I think people are, have a hard time with it and everybody's doing something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, because it hasn't become a cohesive thing yet. Um, and I think that even though, you know, eventually we will be able to go back into the world. <laughs> um, it, it, this is something that people have come to enjoy, that they don't have to worry about going out and driving home or, you know, no. being dressed. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Jennifer, because I will say, you know, in the beginning, I think a lot of people thought this was like a necessary evil and something like we all had to do while this stuff was going on. But we both feel really strongly that this is like a new tool in the marketer's toolbox. And if it's done right, it's hugely valuable and lets you reach a lot more people more consistently, always. It's not just like during harvest season or during the hot season that you people, like it, it's like helpful during the down seasons to do this. And it also helps you reach your club members more consistently and regularly. So instead of just like when they can come in, encourage them to drink that club shipment that they just got by opening up the bottles with you and like not saving it and drinking it and then wanting to rebuy more of it. Right. Yeah. So it's really valuable. And, you know, Evan doing wine tours for 10 plus years, one of the only complaints he would get is, Oh man, I really wanted to meet the winemaker. Right. Like, and you can't guarantee that when you're in person, but on these calls, you can, it's spent, you're spending an hour, you know, to reach 30 people instead of four. So right. yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a question here um, from Greg. Uh, how do you set up the wine you taste number? How do you set up pre-orders? Sure. Yeah, we, um, I'll let you kind of. So, I mean, as Suzanne mentioned, generally we have this bar space here cleared off and the products that we're going to be discussing are on display up here. Um, and then with the camera angle, we, we try to set it up so that you can actually see the glassware mm -hmm. out in front. And, you know, when we were talking about a specific bottle, We'll actually have it up here on the table. Um, we typically do three, I would say. It's generally. Sometimes we do two for our corporate events. Sometimes we do two. Um, but typically we do three tastes and partially because they have to buy full bottles to do the tasting. And that's a little bit of a hard sell. Whereas like if you're in the tasting room, you can just buy the tasting pours. Um, so unless you have those mini bottles, which if you do, please contact us because we're always looking for people who do have those. Or um, if you don't know that this is a thing, you can uh, do it. certainly something that might be worthwhile to look into because it does make the, the, the price barrier of full participation a yeah. little bit lower. If, uh, you know, the participants can have mini bottles of what you're going to be tasting and then go purchase the full bottles of the ones that they like, yeah, for as sure. opposed to purchasing the full bottles of all the things that you're going to be tasting sight unseen and perhaps never having tasted any of your wines before. Or you might want to consider having an optional upgrade add-on that they can add on to their wine bottle purchase. That's a Coravin that you get an affiliate fee on um, to teach them like, hey, if you're going to be doing more of these wine tastings at home, get a Coravin so you can actually just do a tasting amount or maybe send them some of those little glass bottles to like reseal their wine and like teach them how to like preserve their wine for a few days so they don't feel like they're drinking a whole bottle of wine, you know, every time. Um, <laughs> And, and then, then pre-orders. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, pre-orders, you know, we really just do this through promotions and marketing, especially if our winery partners have their own shops on their site. So usually we'll, I would suggest setting up a coupon code or a specific link so you can track how many people are actually ordering for this event. Um, and yeah, and we just direct people on our newsletter, on our social media accounts, everywhere. We kind of direct them to get their wine now. To do that, you do want to start promoting probably three weeks to four weeks in advance so that they have enough time to decide to buy, get it shipped, get their wine, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but yeah, but that's, that's just really all about promotions and, yeah. and encouraging people to do that. And then, like I said, if you don't get enough pre-orders and you're feeling a little upset about that, that's okay. Make people super jealous during the event and like get them to order afterwards and make sure you keep throwing that link in the chat of how they can order and provide a little nominal discount or something, you yeah, know, to kind of encourage that. If it's a possibility, um, making people feel special for attending yeah, that's right. um, by offering them, you know, a little, a little savings on shipping perhaps or on the wine itself is something that people remember and they, and they appreciate. But the promotions matter. We had one winemaker who was great at this and she sold $1,700 worth of wine from our one hour event, yeah. um, which was bonkers. So she was pretty happy with that. I think that's great. Um, we actually have been trying to find a, a, a source for tasting bottles that we can share with our members. Um, if you know of anyone, please let me know because we we might we have a winery partner who's starting to to do this themselves, and so they've looked into it pretty heavily. So we can send you what they've found. Yeah, that would be great. We, it, it, we're I don't think anybody's going to be bottling anytime soon. Um, that's more of a spring deal, but uh, wow. it, it would be nice to have it as a resource. Sure. Yeah, I think right now a lot of people, like at least the people we know who are doing it, are manually unbottling, rebottling, yeah. kind of like to to do, especially for like bigger events, you know. Yeah, and we have some people I know that have growlers and and things that they can or, or sure. kinds that they can use. So they, it is possible right now. Um, yeah. Just gotta find those stinking bottles. <laughs> but yeah. Alrighty. Well, um, if anybody has any more questions, then go ahead and drop that in the chat box. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and end this. And next week, we will be talking about email marketing. Um, nice. Brooke Heron. So um, thank you all. And um, I think we're about done. So thank you, Suzanne and Evan. Um, thank and you. Cheers, everyone. Thanks so much. We follow up with everyone who's attending. <laughs>